This is a repeat of the firing line program originally telecast on April 15th, 1973. The other day, the state of Connecticut ratified the so-called uh, Equal Rights Amendment, uh, bringing at that point the total to 28 states out of the 38 required to graft the amendment onto the Constitution. Uh, the count would have risen to 29, <clears throat> except that on the same day, the state of Nebraska voted to rescind its previous approval of ERA, as the Women's Right Amendment is usually referred to, uh, and therein hangs a a tale. The legislature in Nebraska was not reacting to opposition to ERA mobilized by sexist males, but by women, many of whom on second blush are discovering in the amendment implications they regard as inimical to the best interests of American women. The national chairman of the movement to stop ERA is Mrs. Phyllis Schlafly, who is here today and raring to go. Mrs. Schlafly <laughs> is a graduate of Washington University <clears throat> in St. Louis with a graduate degree from Radcliffe. She is the mother of six children and author of several books, a former vice president of the National Federation of Republican Women, and a national chairman of the United States Bicentennial Committee. Dr. Ann Scott is vice president for legislation for the National Organization of Women, which is ordinarily committed to ERA. Mrs. Scott is a writer who took a doctorate at the University of Seattle studying Shakespeare. She was a consultant in 1971 to the Secretary of Labor on Women's Affairs and has acted as a voluntary lobbyist for all legislation dealing with women's rights. With the National Organization for Women, we're an organization of men and women dedicated to bringing women into the mainstream of American life. We do I not discriminate correctly. on the basis of sex. Thank you. The proposed, uh, the proposed constitutional amendment passed overwhelmingly by the Senate and the House uh, holds that, quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. That doesn't sound particularly subversive, and I would therefore like to begin by asking Mrs. Schlafly to state her principal objection to ERA. Well, it's the very innocuous wording of the amendment that is the reason why many people didn't realize in the beginning what unfortunate consequences it would have. But fortunately, the amending process calls for a full-blown debate in the state legislatures around the country, and this is where we find out some of the things that were not originally realized by many people who voted for it. Uh, we find, as we look into the matter, that ERA won't give women anything which they haven't already got or have a way of getting. But on the other hand, it will take away from women some of the most important rights and benefits and exemptions we now have. What would be an example of that? Well, a great glaring example on which there's full agreement between both the proponents and the opponents is the matter of the draft. Women are exempt from the draft. Selective service says only young men of age 18 have to register. But the Equal Rights Amendment will positively make women subject to the draft and on an equal basis with men. Uh, nor could you have a system whereby the women would get all the nice, easy desk jobs and the men get all the fighting jobs. It would have to be equal across the board, uh, in combat, on warships, and all up and down the line. Do you agree with that, Dr. Scott? Uh, there is no question that if the Equal Rights Amendment is passed, that women would become subject to the draft. However, I think that uh, we have a situation now where the draft is going by the boards. And furthermore, I think the question is not one of the rights of women here, but it is the question of the draft. Clearly, no sane parent would want to see either child, either a son or a daughter, subject to the draft. But if women are to be citizens and citizens are to be subject to the draft, then women should take the responsibilities as well as the rights of citizenship. But it's not simply a question of being subject to the draft. It is also a question of denial of opportunity. There are many situations in which women could benefit from the draft. They already are you in might, the service. You might become a war hero. Why not? Yeah. Well, why, why, why a that? woman did win the Congressional Medal of Honor. The second winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor in the United States was, uh, was a woman, Dr. Elizabeth right? Blackwell. Yes. Is that right? Is that for uh, duty in um, the Civil War. Why haven't they won any since? Because they've been discriminated against. You know, all the wax 
uh, didn't have an opportunity to uh, They did not up. have combat, no. The Women's Army Corps uh, is limited by statute to 2% of the services. And this uh, you, prevents you, many women from having some of the benefits that are available under the draft. For instance, the GI Bill, GI Insurance, and so forth. Even for women who are part of the draft and who have been uh, uh, in the service, uh, many of them do not have the same benefits as men who are also in the service. Their spouses are not taken care of, for instance. Well, I, I, I don't deny that there are, there are certain uh, perquisites that sometimes uh, uh, attach to having been a soldier. But uh, uh, is, this, is, this, is there something in you that, uh, that wants to deny the corporate sense of male chivalry uh, that says women ought not actually to fight wars, they ought to be spared this? And is that incompatible with the amendment, or is there some way in which we could have both? I hope that chivalry would not be directed only toward women, but toward men also. It seems well, to me that well, the principle of chivalry is a principle of human rights, and that's what we're talking about here. No, but this, it's, women, it's, it's, it's obvious that nobody wants the draft, nobody wants wars, but uh, uh, since it seems to be part of the human... I'm hum glad to hum hear that human, from you, Mr. Buckley. Well, seems to, well uh, did I ever give you the impression that I enjoyed wars? I, I, was, very, I was very glad to be discharged. Uh, from the army uh, 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 of the United States. The, uh, the, the, the point is that I, 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 I foresee the possibility of, of, of future wars, and, but at such moment, uh, 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 at least my own tendency would be to spare women, uh, well, the kind of uh, experience that, let's say, um, Commander Bucher uh, had on board the, mm -hmm. the Puebla. Well, frankly, whether the Equal Rights Amendment is passed or not, women would not necessarily be spared that problem you, do you because agree? women can be drafted by Congress. Congress already did pass an amendment, or pass a law in uh, World War II, which would allow women to be drafted, nurses to be drafted, but the president did not sign the law because the war was so close to an end that he felt that they weren't needed. So Congress has the power to draft women now. Well, it is I true. know, but it did, but it, but it is Dane. Uh, uh, there's nothing the Constitution says, there's nothing in the Constitution says you can't draft women, but there is a tradition of not drafting women, right? No, but it, well, the law was passed. I, I was going to say that Congress has used this power to exempt women, and that's the way we like it. And it's very fortunate that we didn't put uh, this amendment into the Constitution 10 years ago. Just imagine what it would have been in Viet Vietnam. Now you talk about the benefits that women will have for the draft. You're going to have to talk about the benefits of fighting in jungle war in Vietnam, and the benefits of being a POW, the benefits of being an MIA, because all this goes with it. And it's our tradition that women don't belong in this. However, Nobody the, the, the proponents do want it, and I have listened to the lawyers in these state legislative hearings, and they all say, yes, they do want women drafted, and they do want them in combat. Now, that is a point of view, but let them go through Congress in the regular manner. I think if such a, a, such a uh, law were, were put out, I don't think it would get five votes, because I think the overwhelming majority of American men and women don't want it. But they're bringing it in this way as a sleeper, so that many people don't really realize that this is the consequence consequence of the Equal Rights Amendment. And once well, it goes on this, in, there's no argument then. There's, there's no, no argument. Dr. Scott agrees that if this amendment is passed, if there were a draft in the future, women would have to be uh, conscripted uh, in, on total impartiality and given identical duties. Not necessarily given identical oh, duties. Well, identical could duties. Be spared combat. Identical duties, uh, the question of duties are awarded on an individual basis. In other words, people have, according to their own individual abilities, are assigned to duty. Now, obviously, this means all women would end up in the intelligence corps. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get to that. They might I, all I end up in KP, too. But well, uh, but they end up on KP at home su already. Su suppose, uh, suppose one took the position that the, uh, the full fuel pack uh, is, uh, is, tends to be too heavy for a woman to carry. Would that be grounds under the amendment to exempt women from service in the infantry? It would probably not be grounds now. I think Phyllis, as a mother of six, can uh, attest to the fact how, uh, can attest to how many pounds women have to carry, particularly young mothers. Yes, but I don't carry them for 20 miles. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, but but in, in their own literature, they say, now for example, the Yale Law Journal, which is the proponent's uh, argument, uh, they say very clearly that women should be a, and should be required to carry the same 40 to 50 pound packs as the men should be put. It does say that in here. And, and they say that so there's no reason why women can't pounds. carry them. You, you know, are they making a biological point? Well, they say that it should be absolutely equal. Put them in combat, assign them. You can't discriminate on a basis of sex. No way. 
You've got to assign them across the board. And does not say that in that in that article at all. Well, no, we, Women we, will we, serve we, in all kinds of units, and they will be eligible for combat eligible. duty. Eligible. That's right. Well, so yeah. everybody is going to be assigned to combat duty. Only a very small percentage of the armed forces are assigned to combat duty. Well, the percentage in Vietnam was about uh, 22 percent. In Vietnam, but that's not of the entire services. Many were at home. Well, sure, but 22 percent were in combat duty, and during World War II, it was something like 35 percent were in combat duty. So, of, no, those in, of those in the theater, yeah, of those in the theater. But, uh, but let, let me just make, do, do, you, do, you, do you concede that there are biological differences between men and women that have a bearing uh, on, uh, on uh, military usefulness or not? I'm not, under, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, do, do, you, do you concede that there are certain things that need to be done in the military for which men are by nature better equipped than women? What do you have in mind? Or changing uh, truck tires. Well, women change truck tires all the time. Well, but not, not quite as you deftly. Think, you, think women are, <laughs> you, think, you think women are incapable of changing tires? I think women aren't as strong as men. Some women are stronger than some men. Oh, well, there's, this uh, there's, is what we're talking about. No, there, some there. women are larger than some men. Yeah, but the, the point some is... Some women are capable of caring more than some men, and some women are much more capable of changing tires than some and men. And some monkeys what are we're smarter than some human beings. The point is we are dealing with, we are dealing with generalities. Many monkeys are stronger than human beings. But this is not what we're talking about. I think what we're talking about well, is, what the we're talking about right, if I it. <laughs> is the human right of individuals to be assigned or to be um, to uh, uh, undertake their own human responsibilities as individuals in terms of their individual merits and their individual abilities. That's what the Equal Rights Amendment would allow to happen. Okay, all right. It does not happen now for it, women. All right. In, the, in that case, you 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 simply say that you desire a condition in America, uh, in which uh, the the people of the United States cannot vote to exempt women from certain kinds of duties. Well, they're voting right now on the Equal Rights Amendment in 30 states uh, through their state legislature. I say you desire that condition. 30 st yeah. That's what's happening. That's but, what, but, a, that's what a, the passage of an amendment is. But it's also true, according to and an asso Associated Press story, that a lot of people who voted for your amendment were shocked uh, when Mrs. Schlafly uh, uh, and her group advised them that, in fact, it would, uh, uh, it would induce a situation of the kind we've just finished describing. I think that uh, what's happening with the amendment is, is, um, is very clearly an indication that women and men both want the amendment. One of the very clear indications of that is that state equal rights amendments came up in six states in the last election, and every single one of them was passed, some of them by a margin of six to one. Now, that's a plebiscite. And these were not in, in so-called liberal new, uh, northeastern states, but these were in Texas and Maryland and uh, New Mexico. Colorado, Washington, and Hawaii. And well, people voted for those by an average of three to I one. Know, it's, it's a question. I think Mrs. Schlafly is, is, is here to say that they voted ignorantly. Uh, well, isn't that your point, so. Ms. Schlafly? Well, uh, the very obvious difference between this and a state equal rights amendment is that uh, the states do not maintain armies or have a draft. And so no state equal rights amendment is going to subject women to the draft. So that is that one very clear difference. And I would also like to say that this article in the Yale Law Journal very specifically says, training and combat may require the carrying of loads weighing 40 to 50 pounds, but many, if not most women in this country are fully able to do that. That's quite true. Now, I do submit that women are not the same physically as men, or can they carry on the same kind of roles in combat duty? I, I think you could see that in the Olympics. If you mixed up the men and women in the Olympics, how many w gold medals are the women going to win? Well, how many of the weightlifting contests would they win? Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. It's very obvious. Well, maybe Dr. Scott will break the record. Well, <laughs> there are a few, but it's a gross injustice to the majority of women. And uh, I think that uh, many people do not realize that this is what the Equal Rights Amendment will do, and it's what the proponents say they want. And in every one of these state legislatures, they come and argue that it's a great denial of women's rights to have them not eligible for combat. Why, why wouldn't you settle, Dr. Scott, for a situation in which um, uh, volunteer women's units uh, would be trained uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and given we are, uh, rigorous duty? We are duty. moving toward that now. There is yeah. going to be a volunteer army. But, but why, 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 why do you want if to if women do, are to be citizens... You, you, want, you want to serve. Mrs. Schlafly believes that her service ought to be of a different kind. I don't want why to do serve. You want, why do you want a law that doesn't permit uh, uh, us to observe her preferences? I don't want 
either my son or my daughter to no, serve. We know you're against war. Don't say that again, please, because we're all against war. <laughs> but go, go ahead. Let's assume that there is a war, that mm -hmm. you are opposed to the war, but the war is going to be fought anyway. Right. Now, now let's talk at that level. Now, why is it that you insist uh, that uh, other women's preferences not to serve uh, oughtn't to be... Um, Oughtn't to be acquiesced in by... If other women's preferences people. are acquiesced in in the, in the right to serve, then men's preferences also must be acquiesced in in terms of the right to serve. So I think in what you're arguing for is granting amnesty. I'm, I'm arguing for giving priority to women in, in certain respects. Is this is your opposed you to? Are. Uh, I see that you are. Yes, I'm, I am absolutely in favor of women having not only the equal responsibilities, the equal rights of citizenship, but also the equal responsibilities. For us not to be part of the responsibilities and difficulties that citizenship entails in this country is to lower our status as human beings. Well, now, to what extent uh, do you consider that uh, you have a, a, a lower status in, in, in the esteem of, uh, of Americans? Well, I think we do because, for one thing, I think we can look at uh, the situation in employment, we can look at the ways in which women are treated in marriage and in divorce, we can look at the ways in which, for instance, domicile laws operate, uh, and we can see that women are considered under the law as subject to their husband, as uh, Blackwell defined it as uh, a women whose beings are suspended in their husbands and who uh, are not, uh, uh, do not have the right to be granted anything by their husbands because it is, they are considered part of his being. Would you concede that point, uh, oh, Ms. Franklin? Oh, certainly not. I think the, the laws of our country have given a very wonderful status to the married woman, and the wife has a great deal of many rights. For example, she has the legal right to be supported by her husband. This is regardless of her own separate means. Uh, he can't make her go to work if she doesn't want to. Uh, she has the legal right, and these are the laws which will be invalidated by the Equal Rights Amendment. No longer can you have any legislation which imposes an obligation on one sex that it does not impose equally on the other. Now, the laws don't say how, how many diapers you change and how much love you put into marriage, but it does say who pays the bill. And the laws now say that it's the husband who has the primary responsibility. Of course, there are uh, differences if, if he's incapacitated or something else, the wife has to assume that burden. But in the normal course of events, it's part of the marriage contract that the husband knows when he gets married, he assumes the obligation to support his wife and children. That is absolutely incorrect, Phyllis. There is no law whatsoever in any state that requires a husband to support his, his wife. As a matter of fact, in the one case, the most recent case, in the controlling case which has been uh, uh, argued, which was McGuire versus McGuire in Nebraska, the court overturned the lower court decision which said that the husband had obligation to support his wife and said that, there, that the law has no right to interfere in an ongoing marriage and that the husband has no legal requirement to support his wife. There is no law whatsoever that says that. And if you get out American jurisprudence, American jurisprudence is a discredited source. It is one which lawyers do not cite in their briefs. Uh, I am arguing from uh, Foote uh, uh, and Levy and Saunders, which is the uh, book on domestic law, which is used by most um, um, law schools. All right, let me answer this, please. Sure. American Jurisprudence, Volume 41, gives the laws as it is generally understood in all the states, says that the most, one of the most fundamental obligations of our whole system is that the husband supports his wife. The Illinois law, for example, says, and I quote, a husband is liable for the support of his wife, and a wife only for the support of her husband, if he is in need of such support, are likely to become a public charge. State after state has laws like this. And if the husband does not fulfill his duty of support, he is criminally liable. And to show you how the Equal Rights Amendment will operate in this, take a look at Maryland. Now, Maryland is a state that put in a state Equal Rights Amendment. And as a result, uh, people have come in with bills to bring Maryland laws into conformity with their state Equal Rights Amendment. So they have now are considering uh, Senate Bill 353 to make it equal. Now, this, of course, takes out the word husband and puts in the word spouse. But when you do this, what the law will do is to make a wife criminally liable for the support of her husband, just as a husband is today criminally liable for the support of his wife. This is fair. what the equal rights and fair. See, that's what they want. Right, that's fair. And, and in all these state legislators here, like any human being, the lawyers does. for the other side, for the proponents, have come in and say, yes, we do want to remove the husband's obligation to support his wife, and we want to make that financial 
obligation fall equally. Now, I say this takes any way you slice it. This takes away the right that the wife now has. Now she's got the whole loaf. She's got the law on her side. And uh, Anne said that the courts don't like to interfere in an ongoing marriage. Well, you courts don't interfere in, in any ongoing contract. If you buy an automobile on time, as long as you're making your monthly payments, nobody interferes. If you lease an apartment, as long as you're paying the rent, nobody interferes. This is because we live in a, in a society that believes in the enforceability of contracts. And marriage is a contract, and it's now part of it, that the husband has the obligation to support his wife. This is what keeps the family together. This is what gives as the wife her right. As the contract right. is on ongoing, but the only way in which a woman can be assured of getting support is if she brings either a separation action or a divorce action. That's completely untrue. There is no, there is, that's that is completely absolutely untrue. true. Well, can't, can't can, you, we can you, refer to our legal panel on that. Can't, you, can't a woman present herself to a, to a court and say that, uh, um, her husband uh, is neglecting her and her children and not supporting them not supporting when that them. happened in Nebraska the court said that, that there was that it had no obligation or right to make the man support the woman well let me tell you what happened when the wife did it in Illinois in Illinois the court said that the husband had to even buy her a fur coat a beautiful silver mink coat and and he had that obligation to do it because it was his obligation to support her even though she had separate means she had ten thousand dollar income of her own and even though she had four other coats now this this <laughs> this is the obligation of the husband and these are the wonderful rights i would say that that indicate that that settlement indicates that she had an excellent lawyer whereas poor women do not have that kind of legal no. representation and therefore they're the ones who do not get supported they do their children. they get it according to the husband's means and the wife Only does not have to go Court. No, no, no. The wife does not have to go to court to get it. All she needs to do is to go to any store and charge the bill to her husband. And in practice, the wife can get whatever she chooses to spend of her husband's money. The stores give her that credit because they know they can collect against him. The law gives them that right. And then it's between the store and the husband to fight about paying the bill. The wife does not have to go to court at all. That is incorrect well, in many you, states. You, you really make this sound, uh, Dr. Scott, sort of like a, a men's liberation movement. In many ways, the Equal Rights uh, Amendment uh, will uh, be uh, uh, helpful to men. If, uh, to the extent that we've discussed it here, they, they would seem to be the principal statistical beneficiaries. Uh, they only have to do one half the fighting, whereas these have to do all of it. Uh, they would not have to support uh, uh, the mother, even though the mother was, in fact, looking, looking after Only if the she child. has to support him also under the circumstances where yeah. she makes a better living than he does. Well, but... Um, uh, do, 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 I, do I understand you to say that? Uh, uh, do I understand you to say that under ERA there would be no presumptive uh, a burden on the husband to support the family? Uh, no, there is no presumptive burden on the husband now well, to support the family. You, you two disagree. Keep yes, we do disagree. <laughs> Let, let's interrupt just for a second and see if Professor Irene can answer that. You're a professor of law. Yes, I'd, I'd who's, be happy right to there? take it on. Um, Dr. Scott is right in descri describing the McGuire case. Um, there it was held that the court will not interfere in an ongoing marriage, so that in order to make a claim for support, the wife traditionally must file for separation or divorce, and that is the outcome. Um, in terms of can creditors ever go after a husband, there are situations in which you can collect for necessaries. I have never heard of a case in which a fur coat was considered a necessary, so well, now you I would like to see your citation on that case. Um, let me just add in general that I think we, we really do an injustice to many women in this country to debate support merely in terms of marriage. May I just add one statistic to the debate since we're there? In 1970, of the 85 million people who were working in this country, approximately 31 million were women. And if we break that down a little further, we find that 12.8 of them were single, widowed, divorced, or separated from their husbands. In other words, one out of three women working in this country do not have a man who can possibly support them. There's another group you asked who are beneficiaries. I think we have to consider the children in the country. It turns out of the families, at this point, of the 51 million families in the country, five million are currently headed by a woman. She is the sole wage earner for the family. Let me put it a different way. 78% of the poor children in 1966 were supported by a woman. Now, it seems to me when we talk about where 
economic discrimination occurs, we can't view all women as connected to a man who might be a source of support. Or give her a fur coat. What, what is your uh, comment on that, Ms. Schlafly? Well, the Equal Rights Amendment is not going to find husbands for women who don't have husbands. Well, how do you know? Uh, well, isn't that true, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, Congresswoman now. Lenore Sullivan answered that point very well in the debate. She said, I know there are many wives who've chosen to work and many other women who work, but I don't want to take away from the wife who, does, who wants to be a full-time wife and mother her right to do that. And that is what she has now under the laws of our states. I'm very now, happy to hear that, Phyllis, and I hope that you will extend and support us in our effort to oppose President Nixon's workfare plan whereby he says that welfare mothers will have to go to work. I assume that you allow that right to stay at home with the children also to mothers on public assistance. Yes, I'd like to extend that. But I, I do think that it's a value to society to have the mother in the home. But they keep citing that one uh, Nebraska case, it's the only case they have out of the whole thousands of cases that are cited and, and are handed down in our country, uh, which require the husband to support his wife. Now, in this matter of employment, that's another field. The proponents of the Equal Rights Amendment have given up claiming that ERA can do anything for women in the field of employment. Even when Dr. Emerson came to testify at the Missouri hearing, he conceded that ERA will do nothing for women in the field of employment, which is not already done by the Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1972. This law is very specific in regard to hiring and pay and promotions. And if any woman thinks she's been discriminated against, she can file her claim, the government will pay the cost, and there have been enormous uh, $100 million settlements uh, of, uh, awarded against uh, a number of companies. AT&T had to, had to uh, pay a tremendous sum, uh, not only to girls who hadn't had uh, the pay they should have, but also to girls who hadn't been promoted, who thought they should have, and even to girls who hadn't applied for the jobs because they didn't think they'd get them. Now, That's this, right. This, We've worked very hard on getting that kind of legislation uh, because we did not have an Equal Rights Amendment. But if we waited to change the laws, law by law, we would wait something like 200 years before we would have complete equality under the law. But there's not really the Equal talking. Rights Amendment can add to what the Equal Employment Opportunity Act has done. But employment is only one area. There are many other areas, too, where women are discriminated against. Well, but against. that's the main one that you've put over on the basis of this equal pay for equal I work, and I one, submit that we've now got it. I can think of, well, if we had it, we wouldn't so be fighting cases, it can but be we still are fighting cases. Uh, Required. But I can think of one other area where I myself was discriminated against in terms of a state law, and that was um, the, the law of domicile, which says that a, hus that a wife's domicile is automatically her husband's. I was living uh, in upstate New York, and I decided to run for public office. I had recently married, and my husband was still maintaining his, his domicile in New York while he finished up a job before he moved to Buffalo. I was disqualified for running from public office on the grounds that I no longer had a domicile in upstate New York, although I had lived and worked in that city for many years and had paid my bills and owned a house. But as far as the law was concerned, I completely lost my domicile, my right to run for public office, and my right to vote in my own community. And that would not have been true of my husband. That was something that happened only to me. But why would you need a constitutional amendment to uh, correct inequities? Because of, there are of that millions kind. of little laws like that in the yeah. state laws, and it takes a long time, and people are discriminated against before they are found out and weeded out. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And that's why it would take 200 years. To no, but, but, but I aren't you trying to accomplish dialogue. something by stealth? Because uh, no, uh, in order to have a in, in order to have a constitutional <laughs> amendment, you need, uh, as, as we all know, two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and three quarters of the states. Now, if you have that kind of a plebiscite, certainly you shouldn't have any trouble getting a simple majority in Albany to uh, permit you to have a, a, a separate uh, a domicile for such purposes as you describe. No, we wouldn't, but we would have to take maybe 200 laws in the state and have them changed, or even more, and have them changed. Well, but but whereas an but equal rights amendment uh -huh, would cause the those... states to look at their entire code and change it so that it would be equitable to all citizens. But, but maybe those laws should be looked at uh, They should be looked at. They should, and they will be looked at. Individually. They will be looked at individually no, under won't. the Equal Rights Amendment. Yes, they will, because no, the states because have... say categorically that all change. The states have two years to well, take their codes and to, and to find the ones that are discriminatory and change them. That's correct. Well, and they, to apply... They, 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 in fact, they all, but suppose they decide that some of them ought, ought in fact, to be retained. Well, then they would, that would be, if they decide to discriminate, the state does not have a right to discriminate. The states do not have a right to discriminate now on the basis of race. Well, they certainly have a, they certainly do it doesn't mean that they don't. They do apparently have a right exactly. to discriminate if we, if we are going to uh, 
or credit Mrs. Schlafly's presumption in favor of the, of the husband paying alimony, for instance? You know, Isn't that a discrimination, I paying find, alimony? I find this argument very distressing. Which? Um, the, alimony? The one that the opponents make, that the Equal Rights Amendment would, would wipe out the, the family, the husband's... Uh, uh, wipe out the, the, the family as it exists now. And the reason I do is that I feel that marriage is a happily married person. I feel that marriage is an institution which has more strength than that. It's an institution which is flexible. It has survived 8,000 years of civilization, and any institution that does that must be strong. And that if the simple principle of human equality is going to destroy marriage, then I find that a very depressing and sad argument. I have more faith in marriage than that. And I think that the Equal Rights Amendment will improve marriage. Do you that think it's going to destroy, women... will destroy the family? Will destroy. I, I didn't say it was going to destroy the family. No, I didn't say that either. But I did say that it, says that it will remove the rights that the woman now has. You see, she has the legal right today to be supported by her husband, and all kinds of wonderful rights. Now, Anne brought out but the would matter. Would you see, would you see the loss of that would result in the destruction of the family? Well, suppose, suppose you take the example that Anne brought up about the domicile. Now, if the wife can go establish a different domicile, how are you going to keep the family together? Yeah, uh, how about that? The family should be able, when two people marry, the family should be able to decide which domicile they wish. You mean individually? Right. How about the children? And a woman, and, and uh, what happens now is that a woman automatically is assigned to her husband's domicile. They should be able to decide. Well, a man ought to have some benefits in this. If he's going to have to pay all the bills, he ought to be able to decide where no, he is. No, he's not going to have to We have bills. just decided that we have just ha well, heard statistics of the fact that men do not pay all the bills. But, but um, well, we haven't heard statistics. Of course, they, they, well, women many women, work. Many women, women work, work, but the husband has the obligation, and the woman today has the freedom of choice. If she wants to take a job, she can, but she has the legal right not to if she doesn't choose to. So it's a matter of free choice on the part of the woman. That and that's why we say that, as, as you brought out earlier, uh, was in the, uh, like Professor Philip Curland of the University of Chicago Law School said, the whole thing is misrepresented as a woman's rights amendment, in fact, the principal beneficiary will be men. It will give men a great opportunity to get out from under their obligations, their obligations to be drafted and to support their family, et cetera, et cetera. It will, entitle, it will entitle men and women both to have equal rights of citizenship. And I don't favor, I don't believe in favoring one sex over the other. I think that people should be treated as human beings first. And I think any man who's worth his salt doesn't want to be married either to a servant or to a a clay statue on a pedestal. He wants to be married to a human being, and that's what the Equal Rights Amendment will oh, do. Oh, come on, that's, that's surely a can't. No, it's I think not. Because, I uh, believe it very well, thoroughly. Who's going to disagree with you? I hope no one. Well, then why did you and say And I it? think the vote that we're having why is... Why did you bother uh, to say something that nobody would disagree with And I think about? that the vote that we had in Congress uh, indicates that but, there's but, very little in spite of the fact it, that your brother voted it, against it. Incidentally, I was glad to hear your ringing affirmation in favor of the family because uh, your, your sister, Jermaine Greer, for instance, feels that the family is really a very pernicious institution and that the genuine liberation of women won't come until after the family, um, or the, uh, the whole idea of the family, or the molecular unit, she calls it, is, uh, is destroyed. Nuclear, nuclear. A nuclear, yeah. Nuclear but um, uh, so, so, I, so I'm glad to hear that you have this, this, this difference, uh, well, even think, though you consider yourself part of the same movement. Of course, I think the, the point about the movement mm. is to show that women are as varied as their numbers. <coughs> we are not all one lump that must be treated as, as if we were all exactly alike. We're all one we're all, we're all human, we're all so all kinds of minds. So, yeah, yeah. And uh, as we are treated now under the law, you those different differences aren't, aren't recognized. You got different. Uh, but you, 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 you wrote, more you, than that, you wrote a Buckley. tantalizing essay. Uh, well, sure, sure, but uh, that's. I, I just don't think we ought to dwell on the obvious. I, I know no, no, no two human beings were alike. Well, I think we have to dwell on the obvious because the problem has been that the, the Constitution, that the courts have not dwelt on the obvious, that they have always treated women as, as, as if we were second-class citizens and not entitled us to the same well, rights. You see, but Mrs. Schlafly is seeking to make a distinction. She is in favor of a restoration of inequalities where those inequalities are, are clearly obnoxious. But uh, you, you desire... Uh, you desire a constitutional uh, amendment, uh, which is, uh, uh, in the opinion of the ranking constitutional scholar of the Senate, Senator Irvin, uh, a, a, a horror, an absolute nightmare insofar uh, as it will cause all kinds of lawsuits, constitutional lawsuits, two, three years from now. I'm happy which that 84 be members of the Senate disagreed with him. Well, was, but that, that's, he, he that's, that's what I call woman power. He, it it exactly. amuses me that... Uh, 
And I, on the subject of woman power, I'm happy to say that the Senate received more mail on the Equal Rights Amendment than they received on any issue whatsoever last year. Really? There's a tremendous... As a result of the fact that women are supported by support. men, they have a lot of time to write letters. There's, there's a, they received letters from both women and men. And there's a tremendous support for the Equal Rights Amendment throughout the country. But, but I think the if fact we look... That, the fact that there's a lot of support for something doesn't mean it can't be ignorant support, does it? Uh, it may very well be ignorant support, but not in the case of the Equal Rights Amendment. Okay, but now you, you, you go so far. I saw an essay you wrote recently in which uh, you said that under the 1972 <coughs> um, uh, Act, you ought actually to have sort of vigilante committees uh, in all of the campuses, universities around the country. And for instance, if you found out that there were more men than women in the engineering school, uh, it should become a legal duty for that university to go out and recruit women to join the engineering school. That already is part of the law. Well, it, We were it, simply being law and order people and trying to make certain that the university carries out its obligations no, 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 as a federal no, no, you, contractor. You were, very, you, you were very enthusiastic about this. You, I am. You weren't saying this reluctantly. You weren't no. saying, God damn it, we've got to do what the law tells us to do. Oh, we must, you, you because the university effect, won't. You were saying, in effect, that unless you have as many women engineers as you have men engineers, something's something is wrong with your ideal society. Well, I right? say that the university has been discriminating against women and <clears> must do something to correct those inequities now. For instance, we have a situation where women have been systematically denied ent entrance to law schools, to medical schools, and so forth, and now it's time for the, for the universities to do something to allow women, like these two fine young women here, to become lawyers. How did they break through the barrier um, before I, your law? Before they, they uh, Frequently, universities had quotas where they would only allow a certain percentage of the students to be women. Now, uh, under, under the Equal Rights Amendment, quotas such as those would be illegal. Well, they would be illegal uh, on all, in all circumstances or only illegal in those colleges and universities that take federal money? Under the, Consti under the amendment, they would, yeah. be only, they would be illegal in any state, local, and municipal <clears throat> uh, university or one which is receiving federal money. Well, would that include a university that was tax exempt? Uh, pro no, probably not. That's one thing, is that the Equal Rights Amendment covers only government action. It does not cover the private sector, except insofar as it's subject to the law. Well, how come they say that if the ERA were passed, uh, a school like uh, Harvard or, or, or Yale, which now has a quota of about 30 percent women, would have mm -hmm. to abolish that quota? It does have a quota of 30 percent mm -hmm. women. That's illegal. Now it it's illegal, yes. What are you going to do about it? What it is, <laughs> we're to already the doing about it. <laughs> we're already working sure, on that. They only have. They only have. A no, what you're talking about is their goal, not a quota. They have a goal to try to achieve equity in Harvard, to overcome the pa the present effects of past discrimination by um, uh, recruiting no, more no, women. No, 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 no. They, they. You see, they have Call a total of 1,300, 1,300 births in the freshman class, mm -hmm. and they guaranteed the alumni that they would continue to take a thousand men, so mm -hmm. that leaves 300 for 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 the women. Mm -hmm. Is that illegal? I think it is, yes. Wow. Well, I don't think that they, but I, I, knowing, I'm, I'm sure that's not what Harvard said. I'm sure what Harvard said was to HEW, from whom they received most of their funding, that we will attempt to bring in within such, a, with such, a, uh, within such an amount of time 30% women to, to try to um, overcome the present effects of past but, discrimination. But now you, you pointed out of, uh, that women are brighter than men, right? Uh, didn't you say that? And that, or at least that they score higher, and therefore you object to a situation in which a college says we're going to have 3,000 men and 3,000 women and take right. the top 3,000 in each category. That's right. Uh, because you say that the women, in fact, scoring higher, there should be more women than men in the. Exactly. Category. I say that they the should ERA take the 6,000 top scoring students yeah. on the basis of their individual merit, not, not on the basis of their sex. Why? Why isn't sex a con why isn't sex a, a consideration? Does mind have why? sex? What? Well, is intellect, that's, is that's, intellect that's, that's, that's a very interesting point. But, well, uh, if, you, if you concede my, my uh, figures about the SAT scores, about the standard aptitude test scores, then... then uh, oh, I, I concede that you said them. The, the, uh, uh, but wh wh why is it... Uh, do I understand that you, des you desire to make it unconstitutional for somebody to, s to have a college or university that has 3,000 men and 3,000 women? if in fact you can show that the 3,000 women had higher test scores than the 3,000 men. I do not want to pay my taxes to a university which discriminates against my daughter mm -hmm. who has a higher score than, than a boy then you and he is accepted over her simply to fill out a quota. So you would be, uh, therefore you, you would oppose uh, uh, taking minority students if in fact it could be shown that they had lower uh, test scores than, than 
than Now some, we're getting into the whole area white, of affirmative action. People. Do you want to get into the area of affirmative action? No, I'm just you asking, I'm, I'm wondering whether you're moment. consistent in, in, in insisting that the only criterion is uh, well, uh, is test scores. The presidential order, which has to do with uh, affirmative action, mm -hmm. states that institutions which accept federal money, which have discriminated in the past, must now take corrective action to improve their uh, employment profiles in order to to correct what has been discrimination and uh, therefore they set they set goals to attempt to find and, and you, that's persons right with you. who are equally qualified that's okay with you it, it's it uh, it does not require people require the university to take people who are less qualified well uh, let's let's uh, go to the panel if you all will alternate questions please to dr. Scott and mrs. Schlafly uh, do you want to start, uh, Professor Irene? All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to refer to some of the earlier comments that were made. First of all, one point of clarification. Um, we've mixed in very different kinds of legal changes in the discussion. Many of these changes are taking place already, as you've indicated, and such things as enforcement of uh, um, non-discrimination in higher education is an obvious example. The Equal Rights Amendment would not apply to private schools or private colleges, I might point out. It's limited to areas covered by state action, so it's not uh, well, What about private schools and colleges under. that receive uh, some kind of state aid, um, which most of them do? At the present time, um, receiving state aid has not been held sufficient to put you under um, state action. It's not to say the courts not, might not move that direction in the future, but it mm -hmm. has not yet occurred. Um, it does, however, subject you to the requirements of the executive orders, which require you not to discriminate with our tax monies, which are given in the form of federal contracts. Yes. Well, if I may point out, the education amendments of June 1972 already give you everything you want in the Are field. you in favor of that act? Yes, and it abolishes discrimination in any school from preschool to graduate level, uh, which receives any federal funds. Now, the point is, this is so much more uh, wider in scope than the Equal Rights Amendment, just like the Equal Employment Opportunity Act is in the field of education. So these two acts have abolished all the, all the legitimate need that there may have been for the Equal Rights Amendment. There's a very broad area of discrimination left in the Higher Education Act, which is entrance uh, as uh, undergraduate uh, entrance in uh, private schools. Left in I'd like to pick up on, on your last comment. Um, you mentioned earlier that everything possible had been done in the employment area, and let me go back. That's one of in so far as it can concern. be legislatively done. Well, I, I want to take issue with that. Um, present statistics show that women currently are being paid at approximately 60 percent the rate of men for doing the same work. Now, those figures have to be qualified a bit because women tend to work more on a part-time basis. But even allowing for that, the Census Bureau says it's approximately 80 percent. So there's clearly some financial discrimination still going on in job pay. Now, to make the statement that we have laws in the area, it seems to me, suggests the reason why we have to go further. It's true. We've had these laws, and they clearly have not gone far enough. And I suggest that's because the problems are related. It's not simply discrimination when you go down and try and apply for that job, but it's the discrimination that occurred earlier in terms of what education you were able to get, specific job categories that you're eligible to apply for. And so I don't think we've covered this area very broadly. I'd like you to come in on that and Dr. Scott. Yes, insofar as that may be true, it is nothing that the Equal Rights Amendment can help. We have a problem of enforcement. Now, the Equal Rights Amendment is not going to automatically give all these women a raise. They still have to go through the enforcing agency, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. These uh, decisions and the administrative decisions are coming down every day. Every week you pick up the paper, and there are more uh, enforcements of this act uh, against various aspects of private industry. ERA would apply only to federal and state employment, so it's not going to give you anything in that field. Uh, Father Ryan, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Right. Dr. Scott. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Father Edmund Ryan of Georgetown. Uh, what I would like to ask is first to point out that in the 1972 amendments to the Higher Education Act, undergraduate admissions are exempted in private institutions. And when we're speaking about admissions... Only if it's all male or all female, no, right? That, uh, yes, you're right. I don't, think it, I don't think it permits you to, to say I'm going to have 80% male and 20% female. No, you are not, but you're not forced to become a uh, co-educational institution if you are but a single But if, if you do, you must go all the way. That's right. Yes, and then, then you would be forced to wipe out all the, right. all the institutions which are all girl or all boy. And that's what my question well, will be to Dr. Scott. One institution which is a public institution, namely Douglas College 
of Rutgers in New Brunswick is a, uh, a girls' college and a state college. Under your particular amendment, do you think that uh, the state of New Jersey should do away with Douglas as a single-sex college? It should make Douglas coeducational, as it should make Rutgers coeducational, and perhaps merge them. I'd also like to say that I recently made two appearances in universities to speak. One of them was at Davidson, which was a boys' school, which had just become co-ed. They had 50 girls. And next week, I'm speaking in Texas at a Catholic girls' school, which has just become coeducational. So it seems to me that the coeducational uh, movement is clearly something of the future. Could I ask Mr. Schlafly? Well, what would well you yes, the Equal Rights Amendment apparently would abolish the right of any school all the way up and down the line at any level to be all girls or all boys if it got any private, any uh, federal aid whatsoever. No, 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 it's specifically exempted. You can continue to have all male schools and all. Is that is that no. not right? But that, that's, no, that's under the, that's under the education. That's under the education. Yeah. Oh, ERA now, would, ERA would, would, would do that, that. And there's been a quite a bit of discussion in the press out where I am about Stevens College, which is a girls' college, and it just goes down the drain as a girls' college if the Equal Rights Amendment goes in. Now, apparently, it is the view of the proponents that they do want to make every school coeducational, and I think this is again their psychology of compulsion. They don't want us to have the right to go to an all girls or an all boys school, just as though they don't want us to have the right not to uh, join the military. And I think under our present system, we have this area of freedom of choice, which we will lose under the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah, why, we why? want everyone to have the opportunity to get the best possible education. And it has to be co-ed. But why should you define the best possible education? Suppose some people say, we, we're a girls' school, we, we want to keep it that way. Why, why, sh why should they have to get your why permission? Why should I pay my taxes and be, not, be denied entrance to Princeton? But we're talking about a private school. We're well, talking about, about a private Princeton school is a here. Private school. Well, no, well, Princeton receives no. But it receives federal, federal funds. Yeah. That's right. Now, why should I, why should I be denied entrance well, be, be, to a university that's using my tax I'll money to exactly discriminate why. against me? I'll tell you why. Because uh, in the first place, we're talking about a girls' school. A girls' school would presumably not discriminate against you. But uh, uh, just as why uh, should you be denied the opportunity? Well, I, 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 to, uh, I will make the following commitment to individual freedom in America, uh, if. Girls want to form a, a school for just girls. I think they ought to be free to do so, provided boys can found a school for all boys. Well, uh, that has been the but, case. But, but, but to, to, to say under the circumstances one. that my tax dollars are going to be used, that seems to be an, an abusive argument, the end of which is merely the homogenization of education, no, which is really what you want. No, I disagree. I think that it is an, an, an enlargement of opportunity and choice. Yeah, but... <laughs> All Mr. Schlaffy is trying to ask, and I'm trying to ask, is why do you want a society in which we either agree with you or we can't go to school? What I want is a society that a great many Americans want, where people are treated according to their abilities and their capacities. Suppose I want one in which they're not treated according to their abilities. Suppose I want a well, school for words, dumb you, people. If you want the right to school, <laughs> that has nothing to do with sex. Well, suppose I want a school for dumb girls. <laughs> suppose, he, all right. So, then why, if you, if you, you want, if you want a school for retarded persons, then you can have a school for retarded persons, but you must be able to take care of the retarded of both sexes. Well, uh, clearly, you, you, are, you are exerting a sort of a Procrustean authoritarianism in which you simply insist on setting up the criteria. And I, I, I don't say that they're ignoble. As a matter of fact, they, they, have, they happen to be very choice, attractive Mr. to me. Buckley. But, I, but I, I just resent the... Uh, I, I resent the dynamic in which uh, you people uh, are all of a sudden want the Constitution of the United States to uh, implement your... Well, when you're talking about will. you people, you're talking about a tremendously wide group of very distinguished women, of uh, national oh, come organizations... On. You only thought of about repute, it a couple of years ago. Of national... These it, they've been turned down for 50 years, this amendment. It has been, it, yes, and it has been supported by both parties for uh, 25 years and, and 30 years. The fact that it didn't pass, does that mean that we've been barbarous during the last five, 50 years? Yes, you've been barbarous, did you say? Yeah, have we? Yes, I think so. And only now have we ceased being barbarous? Uh, I because hope so. Because of the as discovery soon as the of this? 38th, as soon as the 38th state ratifies, then I will agree. <laughs> but when we look at who is supporting the amendment and who is opposing it, I think that we can see who's, who is responsible on the... Oh, come on. on. the... On the far left and the far right, we have the opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment, the Ku Klux Klan, the John Birch Society, the American Independent Party. Professor Paul Freund of Harvard. Professor Paul Freund of Harvard. <laughs> and all those um, other fascists, yeah. And among, <laughs> the, 
And among the, <laughs> among the, the proponents of the Equal Rights Amendment, we have organizations which are well known, whose, whose books and whose roles are open, uh, such as, as I say, both parties, as the Business and Professional Women, the League of Women Voters, uh, the National Organization for Women, Church Women United, American Jewish Congress, Nay Brith, many unions, and well, so the, forth. The overwhelming majority of the people, after all, voted in slavery when the Constitution was enacted. So I don't, think Nixon, but I, I don't think there's any correlation between popular favor and, and uh, historical wisdom. I think we're talking about responsible groups that support an idea whose time has come. And it is clearly true that the Equal Rights Amendment is going to be passed. And it oh, is it's going not to that obvious. Mr. Schlafly is going to let it pass, are you? Well, no, no, I don't think more states have rejected it this year than have passed Nobody it. Nobody can reject and the Equal Rights Amendment until seven years Nobody are can up. reject it. My goodness. No, 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 no she, mean, she until means the conclusively. Seven years yeah. are up. That's correct. Well, they rejected it this year. And uh, we, have, we have gotten eight states to vote to ratify it this year. We have 30 states. We need yeah, but only we've gotten eight to 14 go. states to reject it. They can't reject it. Uh, and we have um, a situation now where I think that it is going to be ratified because there are overwhelming numbers of women who are working in coalition very effectively on the state level and who are going to see that it's passed. Professor Brenda uh, Eddy is with the uh, Department of Business Administration at Georgetown. Professor Eddy. Yeah, um, Mrs. Shafley, I'd like to pick up on just this conversation that they've been having. And it, it really concerns me. You, as I understand it, were speaking for the best interest, as you see it, of the American women, of most American women. And looking at the people who are supporting this amendment, they include the YWCA and, as, as Dr. Scott pointed out, a number of traditional organizations that have worked for women's rights for years and years and are certainly not trying to subjugate um, the typical American homemaker to horrors, such as you indicate. And yet all of these groups, without exception, are, practically without exception, are, um, are in favor of the amendment. I'd like you to respond, if you would, how you account for the fact that, that none of them support you. Well, you are trying to imply that all groups are for the amendment. Now, I prefer to discuss and debate the thing on the issues. I don't think that that's the question, but if you're going to bring it up, you're going to have to tell that the National Organization for Women, which is applying the uh, most intense pressure for this thing at its recent convention, passed resolutions in behalf of lesbians and in half behalf of prostitutes. Are so now, you can, that they don't now I don't make this argument that that's the kind of people promoting it, uh, because I prefer to discuss it on the issues, but if you're going to put that into it, you're going to have to say that. You're also going to have to say that the largest organization against it, against the Equal Rights Amendment, is the American Federation of Labor, which has been consistently <laughs> against it, 13 and a half years. Is it against people, it? Absolutely. 20, 20 on record unions. against it separately support the Equal Rights Amendment, Yes, however. but the AFL-CIO, which has 13 and a half million, is yes. against the Equal Rights Amendment. But so many of those unions the, So also support. is the National Council of Catholic Women, which has 11 million members, been consistently on record against the Equal Rights Amendment, testified against it, and is still against it. Would you explain and, and the their, their membership they... is so vastly in excess of all the ones you cited that there's that's, no comparison. That's incorrect. I'm not sure of the membership of all these organizations. I'm more concerned that they are women's organizations and that they seem to have done, you know, some evaluation on their own. I would be interested, however, in the issues that the American Federation of Labor, FLCIO, and the Catholic Women's Organizations uh, have supported you on. Why do they feel that this amendment is in their best interest? They are opposing the Equal Excuse Rights me. Amendment. Uh, the National Council of Catholic Women opposes it because they think the amendment is destructive to the family. And they've spelled that out in some of the ways that we've already discussed. The AFL-CIO is opposing the amendment uh, because they feel it is very hurtful to the interests of women who do manual work and work in industry. Why? And I do, too. Why? Well, all of our states have erected this fabric of protective labor legislation. Oh, yeah, protect, we got away with that, right? Protect a woman. Protective legislation is already taken care of under Title VII, where, where it is proven to be discriminatory and to deny women jobs or men jobs then it is no longer uh, valid legislation. Well, well, she does confirm that she wants to get rid of it. But what, the, what about when it's discriminatory no, in favor of women? Uh, women can collect Social Security at age 62, men at age 65. That's got to go too, well, right? When we're on, then men should be able to collect Social Security at age 62 also. But, but the benefit suppose, should be extended to men as well. And I think the same argument is true of, of protective legislation. If a law is genuinely protective, then it should be extended to men. And the legislative history of the Equal Rights Amendment says that very clearly. Why can't if it you is, let the men be chivalrous? That's what I want to know. 
Because Seriously, they use their chivalry to discriminate against women and say you cannot have that job where you live 50 pounds. We just gave, an example. We just gave an example. 62 years old, they're allowed to collect Social Security. Now that's been going on for how long? Forever. And particularly now, what's, also wrong, <laughs> what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Chivalrously, men say you do not have to lift 50 pounds, so you may not have this job which pays higher because you are not allowed to lift 50 oh, pounds. You're saying that this is an abuse of chivalry, but I'm talking about genuine chivalry. What are the strings attached to the 60-year-old preferential consideration given to women right now? What strings are attached to that? What do you mean? Social security. The, si the 62? Yeah. I think that men should have the same benefits. I, I, no, no, no. I said, what strings are attached? Don't, don't tell me about men. I don't understand what you mean. Well, you said that the reason men confer these privileges on women is because they use them sneakily in order to get masculine advantage, like this business of not lifting 50 pounds. Now, what, to what use have the men surreptitiously put the 62-year-old privilege for women on Social well, Security? I, the, I think the, the, the real question there is not the question of strings or of surreptitiousness, but I think the question there is whether, uh, is whether or not women have the right to buy the same benefits for their spouses with their Social Security money that men have to, to buy for their wives. Men are discriminated against as beneficiaries of, of Social Security, uh, as, the wi as the husbands of women who receive Social Security benefits. They are not covered in the same way. Women cannot buy the same coverage for their husbands that men can buy for their wives under Social Security. Now, those benefits should be equal because, because, because women pay the same amount. That's because the man is supposed to be supporting himself. And the woman who retires on Social Security gets a larger financial benefit than a man who retires with the same number of years and pay. This is a preference we have by virtue of being a woman. And that sort of thing I is not tolerated. I don't know why you to deny that to men. Is not, would not be tolerated under the Equal Rights Amendment. And again proves that the Equal Rights Amendment is a big takeaway for women. All it does is take give benefits to, and, and to men. men. It would allow women to make sure that their husbands also are provided for at the same rate that they pay but as he's men supposed have. to be providing for himself. But well, women also provide for themselves. Some of the men. I don't think uh, uh, men have sneakily imposed certain things on us. In fact, I'd like to say a word in defense of one man whose name has been raised in questionable context, and that's Professor Paul Freund. I think if you look at some of his statements, you'll find that one of the reasons he objected earlier to the form of this amendment was an argument that the 14th Amendment could be extended to cover many of these cases. We have now had a recent decision of the Supreme Court, the Rodriguez decision involving school finance, that makes it very clear that the 14th Amendment is going to be interpreted very narrowly. Well, I Professor think if Pro Professor Freund Why hasn't were Professor Freund changed his mind? Well, it was only 10 days ago. I would like well, he's to, to very have fast. him speak again. <laughs> 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 I, I think we should definitely ask him. I have a question for Mrs. Shafley. I understand you said earlier that in divorce situations, if there were two children, the result of the amendment would be to give one child to the mother and one to the father. I think legally this is nonsense, and I'd like to know what basis you have for making that statement. We have 20 seconds. The Equal Rights Amendment will wipe out the mother's presumption that she gets her children and enforce some new principle of equality under which the court would make the decision. Now, he might make the decision, as they did in a recent Washington, D.C. case, to give three children to the father and require the mother to play child support. And I think that's the harbinger of things to come. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Child. Would it be cut in half? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Schlafly. Thank you, all the ladies of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry. Next week, Dean Rusk joins Mr. Buckley for a repeat of the Revisionist Historians. For a printed bound copy of this program, send 25 cents in coin to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. Thank <laughs> you.